after Chris's presentation. Okay, I so hope. Your turn. Thank you. Sorry, can you hear me now? We can hear you and we can see your screen. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very much, David. I, I, I like this initiative, so I was, I was happy when you invited me to, to take part in this. And, and the title I provided, David, is, is exactly what I intend to do. It is, um, th this is going to be a series of snapshots on um, some examples of the research that we carry out in my, in my team or in my research group without uh, really any effort to try to fit this into any overarching narrative of um, any sort. So I'm going to be taking more of an opportunistic take on, on, on the organization of the presentation, but hopefully uh, you will judge at the end whether I've managed to connect some of these dots or not. Also, um, most of you know that uh, a good part of my research uh, revolves around structural timber engineering, so I've taken the opportunity to look also at other projects, uh, at the branches, so to speak, right? So let's, let's start in a rather um, unexpected place for, for structural engineering. Uh, let's start in the Formula One Championship of 2007, when the McLaren team interposed a demand against the Renault team because uh, Renault had had uh, unauthorized access to a series of specifications on the McLaren car, including specifications regarding spe a new type of damper that was nicknamed J-damper, that was supposed to increase the grip of the car in the racing track and, and therefore improve its performance. It was later known that this J-damper was, was actually an inerter, and what happened uh, was that Professor Malcolm Smith from Cambridge had been advising uh, the McLaren team, and he had published in 2002 uh, uh, a synthesis of electromechanical networks where he describes the inerter and coins that term. But probably he didn't know uh, that uh, Japanese researchers had already been looking at uh, exactly the same device some years before, and they published in 1999 a series of experiments on inerters uh, in the Architectural Engineering Journal of Japan. So what is this inerter? This inerter is, uh, is, is basically a device that outputs forces that are proportional to the relative acceleration between its turns. So in, in one of its more uh, widest um, realizations, uh, it's like a humming top. So in this case, you get this disc to rotate by the action of this ball screw, and the force that you, you need to apply to this toy to, to, to start its motion is proportional to the relative acceleration between points A and B. So in thinking of ways to incorporate this into the structural engineering world, we can uh, imagine a very simple structure, a single degree of freedom system, a single story, single bay building, where we have a, a flywheel that is attached to the slab by means of this rack and pinion system, and that is supported on this uh, relatively rigid uh, uh, bracing system. And if we formulate the equation of motion, we will get the, the, the very typical formulation of equation of motion, where on the right-hand side, we have the effects of the, of the ground motion, so mass times acceleration of, uh, of, of, the, of the ground. Then we have this term that depends on the displacements, this term that is related to the forces that we call viscous forces and are uh, dependent on the velocity, and this term that is uh, the force uh, that is the inertial force that depends on the accelerations. And here you can see the mass of the slab and this term B that is the apparent mass that is afforded by the inerter. So here you can see already the, the, the implications of this, uh, this discovery, right? For years, we structural engineers and a lot of our training, training in many parts of the world really concentrates on this term. We change the dynamic properties of our system by changing its uh, section and, and modifying its period. We also have nowadays a, a good family of uh, supplemental viscous dampers that will operate on this term, on the velocity-dependent term, 
but we have been really not very successful in operating on this term of the equation of motion. So what the inerter does is, is complete our toolkit so that we can now have a full access to uh, modify our, our, our dynamic response uh, affecting every single one of the terms of our equation of motion, except, of course, the earthquake-related one. Now, if we must normalize this equation of motion, we divide it by m plus b. We have a new term appearing here, which is omega, is, is, the, is uh, the natural circular frequency of the system. And here, in this new expression, you can see exactly what the inerter is doing. Here, you can see that it's elongating the period of your structure. And here, you can see that it's uh, reducing the effects of the ground motion. But not only that, also, if you think of attaching your flywheel to a series of gears that will amplify the motion, so that with very small initial motion, you can get a very large rotational velocity at the end, then you are basically dissociating or, or distinguishing between your gravitational mass and your inertial mass, right? And that means that with very small amounts of actual masses in your flywheel, you can generate significant inertial forces. So you have a very effective uh, uh, and high-performing system, uh, a device, that works over a wide range of periods, but it has a handicap because you, you, you can imagine this flywheel rotating and therefore it accumulates some kinetic energy. And sometimes it will deliver that kinetic energy to your structure when you don't need it. And uh, that means that sometimes, not always, but sometimes the inerter will end up driving the motion of your structure. And we need to limit displacements in structures because displacements are related to uh, strains and strains to damage. So we want to limit damage. And one of the options for, for solving this is to have a mechanism that will detach that inerter when it's not needed and will it attach again uh, when, when we need it. And that's basically a, a clutch that permits the rotation of both shafts in one direction but only allows one shaft to rotate in the other direction. And that was the work of Carlos who visited uh, us from Aachen and he performed a series of experiments. Uh, here you can see that we are reducing the system to its bare essentials to understand the fundamentals, and then we will be scaling this up to the structural engineering scale. So here we have a column with a mass, a source of compliance. We have uh, the inerter, which is uh, a rotating disk that is uh, um, attached by means of this rack and pinion system. And he performed a series of, of tests, including single inerters, uh, and also inerters with clutches. And when you have a clutch, you need to have two devices because one will be acting in one direction while the other either remains, uh, remains idle in the, uh, or acts in the other direction, right? So he performed a series of experiments on these small scale uh, models. And the results of the proof of concept were quite encouraging. Here we have a graph that is um, plotting the uh, accelerations, peak accelerations, against different period ratios. And you can see that the, the, the structure with the clutch at inerter really experiences significantly lower accelerations than the unprotected structure. And this later translates into reductions in deformations and, and so on. So we performed a series of numerical and experimental and also some analytical studies. We also later on implemented this, this device numerically into some control problems, benchmark control problems. In this case, for example, I'm presenting the, the, the results for a nine-story steel building subjected to a Mavro Edis and Papa Giorgio poles at, at its base. And um, the graph represents in the vertical axis the maximum deformation of, of the building divided by uh, or normalized by the energetic length of the ground motion and in the horizontal axis we have a, a, a ratio of periods, the period of the structure normalized by the period of the ground motion. The black curve here uh, represents the, the unprotected structure and the red curve here corresponds to the, the clutched inerter system, right? And you can see that there is a massive reduction in deformations and therefore in damage in our structure. But the reason we started looking at inerters is really because we wanted to limit damage in, in, in timber buildings. And this is a test we carried out uh, some years before on a, a series of CLT walls with the help of Rumble, the, uh, the Ice Track T, and also Ron and Trevor in the lab at Imperial. 
And here we have uh, a CLT wall, which is a laminated wall that can be manufactured in, in lengths of up to 15 meters, heights of up to four or five meters, and thicknesses of, of uh, up to 350, 400 millimeters. So it's a very dimensional, stable um, wall that can be used for lateral system, uh, resistance systems and also for slabs. And it is usually connected to the foundation and also between, uh, between walls by means of steel brackets. And that's good because we want to give ductility to the system, and that's what, what steel does. Nevertheless, uh, ductility is, is associated uh, with, with uh, damage. So we get some uh, fracture damage here, and we also uh, end up damaging the, the wood matrix. So with... Um, with Fernando, we've looked at um, several ways of trying to model the damage accumulation under cyclic loads in timber structures. But another approach is really to try to detach your wall from the, the, the foundation and allow it to uplift and rock, right? So, so basically, we are not using now anymore these brackets. We are allowing your, your, your building to uplift and rock. And that uh, reduces the, the, the peak deformations and reduces the damage as well. And this, this principle is not new. It has been used uh, by several uh, other researchers in the past. And, and it's the reason why uh, the historic structures, uh, some of the historic structures st stand to, to this day, uh, despite the fact of having been subjected to severe earthquakes in the past. So here we have the walls of the Wiracocha Temple in Cusco that are very slender and very tall walls that uh, have survived many earthquakes uh, by allowing them to uplift and, and, and rock. They, they didn't survive the Spanish invasion very well, but they did survive uh, um, uh, a significant number of, of large magnitude earthquakes. So with Rodrigo, we, we started looking at uh, ways of implementing inerters and coupling them with uh, rocking uh, timber walls to try to reduce deformations and also accelerations that can be large uh, and can uh, otherwise compromise the functionality of the building, even in those cases where, where the building survives the ground motion. The problem with rocking, though, is that it, it is very different from the sort of systems that we have been, um, that we are more familiar in structural engineering. To start with, uh, fixed base structures, conventional structures, will be normally characterized by a period or a series of periods, right? So it's, it's the way they prefer to vibrate. In the case of rocking structures, their resistance to motion is mainly governed by inertia, and we don't have a, a, a period as such. You can, you can visualize that when you drop a, a coin and you see the, the motion of this wobbling coin, uh, the rate at which it moves depends on the amplitude, right? So something similar happens with, with these rocking blocks. We instead have a frequency parameter that doesn't carry the same conceptual significance as, as, as frequency in fixed space structures, but is expressed in hertz and is defined as the square root of 3g, where g is the acceleration of gravity, divided by 4 times r, where r is the distance between the centroid and the pivot point. And this is the equation of motion governing the, the, the rotational acceleration of this uh, rocking block. And you can see that this uh, frequency parameter really governs the motion. Not only that, but it has been observed in the 60s, since the 60s that the larger of two geometrically similar blocks can survive uh, ground motions that will otherwise topple a smaller, a smaller block, right? So, with Rodrigo, when we included the inerter in this uh, fundamental representation of, of, of the rocking motion, we came up with a new expression where now this p parameter, the frequency parameter, has this sigma in the uh, denominator that is the apparent mass ratio that is brought about by the inerter. So basically, we are reducing the frequency parameter, and therefore our block behaves as if it was of a larger size. And we've seen that uh, larger blocks are inherently more stable than smaller blocks. So that's good news. That means that we can modify the dynamic response of, of our rocking structures with all, without really uh, changing their geometry. And we, we've looked at uh, several uh, configurations. We've included compliance. We've included uh, different um, post-tensioning uh, as well. And here, for example, uh, you can see a comparison of peak deformations against uh, frequency ratios 
for the fixed base case in green, the rocking plus viscous damper, which is uh, sort of the preferred situa uh, retrofitting solution nowadays, in black, and then in blue, we have the rocking plus inerter. And you can see that the rocking plus inerter solution uh, outperforms the other two in, in uh, you know, in the full range of, of uh, frequencies. And with Rodrigo, after studying the fundamentals, now we are scaling this up and we are also trying to understand ways in which we can design these. We are uh, studying the response of multi-story buildings to real earthquakes and so on. We've also, with Lina, tried to expand that idea of damage avoidance systems to steel structures in this case. And um, she has been looking at the response of um, post-tensioned um, steel uh, frames looking at ways to provide different um, bracing configurations that will accumulate less fatigue damage, for example, uh, doing a lot of numerical analysis and being able to uh, simulate the full frequency response function of a very highly, high, highly nonlinear problem like this. This is a test that was conducted by our collaborators in Bristol in the shaking table they have there, right? So, um, it is always nice to have these sort of validation tests on, on large scale um, shaking tables, but it's also nice to complement them with these smaller tests um, in smaller shaking tables because you can produce uh, really um, a lot of uh, experiments. You can carry out a lot of experiments and produce a lot of results. And this is the shaking table that I presented before. Uh, we built it ourselves uh, based on Arduino boards and a servo motor. And therefore, we have full control over it. It, it has a range of frequencies that is uh, of interest to us, uh, up to 500 hertz, uh, sorry, 5 hertz. And it's kind of, 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 of good for, for our small purposes. And we've used that also to, to uh, propose uh, um, a teaching exercise for our third year dynamics students, and uh, here you can see uh, one of the submissions of, of this, uh, this year's students, yes, uh, where they are tasked with the design, uh, 3D printing, and then testing, dynamic testing of simple structures like this. So this, this idea of using low-cost, off-the-shelf um, uh, control systems, small boards, and also MEMS accelerometers for quantifying the, the or measuring the, the acceleration, so on, was further developed uh, with uh, Team and Nikos from Portsmouth. We have analyzed and, and tried uh, different sort of MEMS, a variety of microcontrollers, Arduino, Peak, so on. We finally uh, set up for specific configuration with, um, we've produced some acceleration sensing kits, some wireless sensing kits uh, that are now being used, for example, by Heinrich. In, in, in his uh, uh, dissertation. And he's uh, looking at ways in which, just by means of outputs, only acceleration, we can uh, identify uh, the, the structural properties and also try to look at damage localization. So he has, um, well, Tim has built these um, steel frames that are in his backyard now. Uh, due to COVID, his backyard has become uh, an impromptu lab, and we are able to retrieve some of these um, uh, stiffness matrices, uh, damping matrices, and so on. And we are now finalizing our coordinations to uh, instrument this um, bridge, a 500 meter long bridge in southern Peru, uh, together with uh, a couple of COVID hospitals. And the final project that I want to highlight uh, today has to do with vibrations as well on timber structures, but not related to, to ground motions or earthquakes. In this case, we are looking at footfall action and general vibration due to, to wind load as well. But uh, the, the particular project that I'm highlighting here is, is, due to, is uh, related to footfall action. So this is a 14-story um, timber building, fully timber building, uh, constructed in Norway. Uh, the lateral resistance system here is, is uh, composed of this truss system of laminated members. And you can see that um, each, uh, each some um, number of stories we have uh, a thicker slab there. What happens is that in many situations, 
uh, timber really outperforms, uh, underperforms dynamically because we have uh, a very lightweight material that tends to cluster a lot of modes in, into, into uh, specific frequencies and therefore amplifies the motion, especially to fruitful action. You, 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 you probably have uh, experiential knowledge about that as well, right? And um, the problem is that we s the solution sometimes comes as um, casting a concrete slab on top of the timber floor. So it adds mass to change it, its dynamics, and it also adds stiffness. Now, it seems to me that that is a bit counterproductive because we sell timber precisely on the basis of it being environmentally friendly and lightweight that it's easy to, to, to manipulate on site and so on. And then we end up putting some concrete on top of it. So our idea was to try to look at ways in which we can use digital design and manufacture to change the shape of these buildings to incorporate some resonators that will be tuned to specific vibration modes that will then mitigate the, 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 the amplification of um, certain accelerations and therefore will um, not need this um, concrete topping on, on, the, on, the, on the slabs. And this idea has received some, some recognition as well. So this is, this is uh, the sort of collage that, uh, of, of some of the projects, by no means comprehensive, just some of the projects that we've been looking at in, in our research group. But really at the heart of it uh, is, is, a, is a group of very brilliant and, and, and curiosity-driven uh, researchers that are devising, understanding, and promoting new sustainable structural systems and structural assessment methods. So thank you. I think that's 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 all from me. If I just go out, and you can take over. <laughs>